Okay, welcome everybody to the Voyage National Jury Exhibition uh, at ARC Gallery in San Francisco, California. This is the Artist Talk. This is the second of our series of two. And tonight we have uh, eight artists that will be talking about their work in the exhibition. I'm Stephen C. Wagner. I'm one of the owners of ARC along with Michael Yoakum and Priscilla Otani. So the first artist we're gonna hear from is Jill Andre. So Jill, go ahead and unmute yourself. Introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from. Uh, yes. Talk about your piece in the exhibition and your inspiration for that piece. Yes, thank you, Stephen. I'm Jill Andre and I'm in San Francisco and my piece is Sheltering Sun. I'm known for my figurative work. All my figures are based on drawings from at least 20 years of sketchbooks that I have. So I've got thousands of drawings um, the models that I use, they're performers, they're dancers, they're actresses, and they often move during their performances. So it's not a traditional um, life drawing setup at all. And this particular model, she called herself Pigeon. That was her name. And I think I did the original drawing for this a good seven, eight years ago. And the drawings stick with me and over time, I come back to them and part of the process then is also finding the right color palette. I usually draw just a lot in black and white. And then the feeling of the pose of the gesture is what brings me to the color. And I love color, I'm, I'm such a colorist and I'm obsessive about color to the point where I make my own little color chips with the formula on the back so that I can remember how to mix colors. And so I have hundreds of, of my color chips that I use then to develop the feeling of the color. So sheltering sun is a bit of a, a dreamscape. I'm a, I'm a lucid dreamer. And so this figure is traveling in her imagination and there are places to go. The, the small boat appeared there was not a boat in the model stand, but her, her stance made me feel like she was going on a voyage. So that was part of the developing of this painting is that feeling. And then the, the boat, the sun came after as, as a way to silhouette, silhouette her face and her hair and her pose. I don't use photographs for my models. That's why they're often, Sometimes I call them starfish hands or, or odd poses. But in this particular one, I had taken a picture of this piece and I didn't have the little glints of gold in the water. And when I took the photo, a lamp had been shining on, on a photo on the painting. And I looked at it like, oh, well, that's what it needs. So there's very much a, a process of discovery in the painting itself. I don't have it all entirely mapped out. So that is a little peek into my process. And I wanted to thank you guys for inviting me to Voyage and to talk about my art. Okay, Jill, thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, we appreciate you participating in the exhibition. So, and you talked about uh, that you do mainly figures. Yes. Um, so um, what is your inspiration for uh, the individual poses that you use in your paintings? So I do, I um, draw from models almost always, I draw from life and the models that I, I use, um, they really give with their whole body because the, the poses are very short. And so it's a very uh, emotional giving of, of the model. So I also draw quite a bit from, not this one, but quite a bit from people at work. That's one of my favorite things is, is to watch people working and, and, and see their gestures and their poses. So I'm, I'm always sketching people. Okay, and then you place the figure in a setting. So you create a setting for each I create figure. the setting, yes, yes. So this one, I had the, the, the shape and the outline and the feeling of the figure. And then over time, I, I try to find a setting that complements the pose of the figure. So it's, it's separated now from what would have just been a, an art room or a, a drawing studio. And I put my own sort of backdrop and, 
kind of a stage set that I imagine. So I integrate a stage set in with my figure. Okay. And so does the pose inspire that background? It does for me. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of a, a longing, a wishing to uh, perhaps travel to go somewhere and some, some memories as well. So it's, it's future and past for me at the same time. Okay, Jill, thank you so much for uh, sharing more enlightenment into your piece. We appreciate you participating in the exhibition. So the next artist we're gonna hear from is Janet Berner. So Janet, please unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, talk about your piece in the exhibition and your inspiration for the piece. Hi, my name is Janet Berner and I'm from Tucson, Arizona, where I'm in my studio slash gallery. Um, I've been a ceramicist for 52 years and had a business for 50 years. Um, this piece that I entered in Voyage or Voyage um, is actually a scene from I own property in New Mexico. And it's a scene of the river. It has run, a river running through it, which is what I named my piece. It's uh, stoneware, high fire, fired to 2300 degrees. I start with a, a simple uh, vase form thrown on the potter's wheel, and then I paddle it and sculpt it. But I've always drawn and painted. And during the pandemic, I really got into doing more painterly ceramics and more art forms rather than functional cups and bowls and plates. Wonderful to have been invited to be in your show. And I came to your opening and thought the show was ex very exciting. And I really enjoyed San Francisco too. So thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this artist talk. Okay, Janet, thank you so much for sharing us uh, with us a little bit more about your work. And I'm so glad that you could come out to San Francisco from Arizona to be in the uh, opening reception uh, for the exhibition. So you talked about that you like to draw and paint. So do you draw and paint on other media or you do you always draw and paint on your ceramics? Well, actually, I've been teaching ceramics at the Tucson Museum of Art since 1970. And because of that, I was enabled to take figure drawing classes throughout 50 years. And so I just finished um, one of my collages is behind me. I just finished taking 50 years of drawings that were hidden under my bed and reworking them as collages, cutting out the best pieces. So I do both, but primarily my um, direction and main direction is ceramics and always has been and I love art period but okay and and your piece here is is a landscape so do you do mostly landscapes or do you do oh, other not subject matter? I do I, I'm very eclectic I really do lots of different kinds of work from I do sculptural work um, you know figures I do a lot of figures figurative work working on the clay out pushing it out from the inside and making figures running around the pots. But I guess my um, direction at this point in my life is to make play as art. And with the however many years I have left to be a potter, I don't know if you know how uh, extensively physical it is. You know, I'm just trying to create as much as I can right now of artwork. And then I, my plan is, as I'm unable to make ceramics at some point, um, to draw and paint more and continue on. I hope I'm around to win 100. Oh, we hope so, too. So can you talk about the colors that you chose that are in this piece? Uh, these are underglaze colors that are specifically and really came on the scene recently to um, that withstand the temperature of 2,300 degrees uh, for many years you couldn't get colors like this. And they, they appeared about five or six years ago, which just excited me tr tremendously into painting on clay. And they're, they're Amico underglaze colors, which in this piece, it was stoneware and it wasn't, there's no glaze on top. If I do put a glaze on top, I, I throw them out of porcelain and I fire them in oxidation, which is 
uh, in an electric kiln, but this one was fired in reduction in a gas kiln with no glaze on it. So, and then the colors stay bright. If you were to put a glaze over it, it would change the colors tremendously. And I did that all through sort of trial and error and figuring out what worked and what didn't work. And Okay, Janet, well, it was a pleasure to hear from you. I'm glad you could be uh, part of the artist talk tonight. Um, and we're going to go to the next artist. So uh, we have Rebecca Chow. Rebecca, if you could introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, talk about your piece in the exhibition and your inspiration for the Voyage exhibition. Yes, I'm calling you from the uh, East Bay Hills, and um, I'm so honored to be part of this group. And uh, my painting in the gallery um, is a painting. It's acrylic on canvas, and the canvas size is 36 by 36 inches, and the thickness is 1.5 inch. inch. Um, well, the uh, title of the, the um, painting is called Travel. And I did this painting last year because I was you know, hoping to travel a lot more because of um, COVID. And I do go to Paris uh, off and on. Last year was twice. And so travel was a big part of what I do with my art. I exhibit over there and I exhibit here. Um, and also I have this mental picture always as being able to go beyond the here and now, like uh, space travel, um, travel in the galaxies, if you could imagine that um, one day or in a thousand years from now, whatever. But the, the fantasy about travel and about being able to get beyond the here and now is, is with me. So when I created my painting, I had that in mind as always actually. And, um, and I do hard edge uh, geometrical abstraction. So I would only use a few colors. Um, in this painting that I have, it's um, seven colors. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six colors. But I consider white a color. So I have the, the two incongruous shapes. You know, the bottom is like pretty solid volume and the top is more, you know, colors, but floating. So, but to put the two shapes together and to make it work, the incongruity becomes congruous because somehow they dominate the, the space that I have in a way that creates more both um, movement and also some interest in terms of negative space and positive state space moving back and forth. So there's movement and not visually. So that's, um, that's what I do. And I really enjoy creating it and I enjoy looking at it. So, and I'll stop here. Okay, Rebecca, thank you so much for uh, giving us insight to your process and the piece that's in the exhibition. So can you give us, uh, uh, share with us your inspiration for the title uh, specifically in this piece? Well, um, travel, um, is kind of related to the theme of the show. And, um, and I think all of us, either, whether we're here or not, we're always thinking about travel, right? Um, travel from here to wh whatever. And, and it's a very basic kind of a term. I don't use fancy words like odyssey, some other paintings I call odyssey and this and that. Uh, or voyage. I just think travel is very down to earth and that's why I call it that. Okay. And it's always on my mind. Okay, and so when you uh, paint your geometric abstractions like this, mm -hmm. um, do you always use incongruous colors to balance out? Well, not always. Sometimes the colors are much more harmonious. Um, but I also like the fact that I challenge myself and I would um, sometimes shock myself by putting colors together that don't seem to work, but they do. And so that's my challenge and, and that's why I do it. Okay, and how long have you been doing uh, the geometric abstractions like this? The, the geometrical abstraction about um, five years, five to six years. I used mm -hmm. to be more figurative and at one point more um, abstract expressionism, you know, or used to do portraits years ago. But now I'm very interested in being very minimal and being very geometrical.
Okay, and this is a uh, 36 by 36, so it's a relatively large piece. Uh, yes. So is this your a typical size that you work in? Oh, uh, yes. Actually, my sizes are larger. So this one is like a middle of the road. I've done some um, in, in centimeters, like 150 to 100 by 120. Or, you know, you could say it's 48 by 48 or, you know, 56 by 56. But I do very small works as well. Sometimes like um, and they're just as hard, you know, a small works, not easy, um, like what, 12 inches by um, eight inches kind mm -hmm. of a shape. Yeah. And the small ones take just as much time. You guys okay. all know that, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Rebecca, we're so happy that you could uh, participate in the exhibition and be part of the talk tonight. And thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Okay. And the next artist we're going to hear from is Sam Kramer. So Sam, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, uh, talk about the piece that's in the exhibition and your inspiration for the theme. And my name is Samantha Kramer. Um, I uh, live in San Francisco. Um, and this piece is uh, a photograph. So it's two photographs compiled together. Um, layered on top of each other. The uh, photograph that you see of the children sitting um, is of my mother um, and her cousins and sisters um, along with um, my grandmother. And they had just moved from California, um, from New Orleans to California. Um, and this was kind of a really big decision that that they decided to do of moving away from all of their family um, and deciding to try to find a new life within um, California. And so when I decided to move to New Orleans for a year, um, which the second photo of the bayou is taken of um, with my film camera, uh, I really wanted to explore kind of the idea of going back to a place that um, my family had left and uh, really connecting with the family that was still remaining in New Orleans. Uh, the mixed emotions that come with that. Um, also the feeling that I have of, of looking at old photos, um, but of experiencing those things myself. Um, but the goal of this, this work is to, at the end of the day, no matter what the emotions are between those who have left and those who have remained, that there is still a connection there's still like love and and enjoy even if there are some dark shadows and there are um some hard parts uh at the end of the day uh the ties between each other remain and and they're impactful and important um and so i've done photography um for about five years now and uh it's been nice to also look at the photography that's happened in my my family's collective memories as well, like this photo of my mom when she was a child and, and using my own photography to, to interlay that together. Um, so overall, this, this piece means a lot to me and, and examines a lot of emotions and, and feelings that I have about my experience living in New Orleans um, and dealing with it all. But thank you so much for having me. I really appreciated sharing my art. Okay, Sam, thank you so much for talking about your piece that's in the exhibition. Um, so do all the pieces that you work on are layered in, like this? Yes, so uh, I use a lot of layering techniques. My last um, collection of, of photographs was about the collective knowledge of Black women and the softness of them. So I took portraits um, of the women in my family and um, overlapped them through either manual double exposure with my camera or um, post um, production and was trying to emulate this feeling of softness and beauty within in black womanhood that isn't celebrated as much. And so um, I really like the layering technique to allow kind of a feeling of, of memory, of, um, of softness, of kind of the edges being a little bit blurred um and and just kind of the in-between of it all okay and it looks like the photo of your uh, mother's 
family is uh, tilted versus the photo that's in the background. So can, do, can you just address how you uh, do the composition here? Yeah, I really wanted to kind of show the idea of like looking through a memory box because all of these photos are, are photos that I I had never experienced, but what does it kind of feel to, to look at um, a photo of your grandparent and be like, oh my goodness. Like, I think all of us have had that collective feeling of looking at someone that you know who's a certain age and looking at them when they're a baby and being like, how is this the same person? And I think I really wanted to try to make it seem natural and make it seem like you're looking through the photos of your family. Um, and, and that was kind of my goal. Okay, and I see kind of a, a muted green and also a, a, kind of an ivory color. So how do you choose your coloring? Yeah, I honestly, I love the color green. I, uh, a lot of my photos uh, that I uh, have in exhibits and galleries uh, use the color green. And I think that it's um, such an earthy color, um, very obviously, but it's, it's very grounded. Um, and I think that it, it allows, especially because a lot of my figures in my work are, um, specifically African American people, um, and black women, it's, I'm trying to show the groundedness of them and show, um, kind of the intuitiveness of, of, of black womanhood a lot. Okay, Sam, so thank you so for giving us a better understanding of your process and your uh, subject matter, and thank you for participating in the artist talk tonight. Okay, so the next artist we're going to hear from is Julia La Chica. So Julia, go ahead and unmute yourself, introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, and talk about your piece in the exhibition and your inspiration uh, related to the voyage theme. Hi, my name is Julia La Chica. I'm based out of Oakland, California, on the unceded territory of the Chochenyo Ohlone people. My piece titled Roots Are Strong, The Journey to Freedom is a 40 inch by 60 inch acrylic painting on canvas. This is a commissioned piece and it's inspired by the work of a photojournalist, Brooke Anderson and Oakland street drumming ensemble, Boom Shake Music. It pays homage to our musical director and co-founder, Monica Hastings Smith, who transitioned to the ancestral realm in June of 2021. Roots Are Strong is a reference to a song written by Monica that speaks of our collective struggles and urges us to stand strong, to lean on each other, our wisdom and move forward into the future. I wanted this painting to reflect the energy that is created when we march side by side, drumming and chanting in unison, adding energy to various actions we show up for, like housing, uh, fair housing, living wages, police brutality, and Black lives. Um, I painted a red cape to symbolize Monica's superpower, bringing community together, leading with voice, with love, compassion, and always encouraging and embracing the group's superpower. The golden aura around them shows as they were guided by their highest good in life and in death. Dandelions traveling through the time and space scattering seeds speak to the immense power one person can have to inspire many while water pouring from the drum offers life to the calla lilies, an offering made in their honor. Other symbols and meanings of colors are green for nature, health and growth, representing hope for the future. Purple for strength, transformation, wisdom and power. Sepia, the color of nostalgia and the sense of history and orange, circle for unity. Thank you for inviting me to talk about my work. Okay, so Julia, thank you so much for uh, talking about the piece that's in the exhibition and explaining the symbolism of the colors and the images that are included. Uh, this is a very dynamic piece. Um, so could you talk about the process? 
the process that I take when I when I begin a painting is um, I do a lot of mark making and just a lot of movement to loosen up. Um, and then a lot of that gets covered up with images that I start to apply. Um, I like to, to use high flow colors and that causes a lot of the drips. Um, I'm very attracted to uh, nostalgic images, images from the past. Um, I like to talk about history um, and that uh, in many instances shows up in my painting. Okay, and the, the piece is very dynamic um, and you're, it's about the drummers and the marching. So is are you part of that group and do you march on a regular basis? Yes, um, I am part of the group. Uh, we have not done a lot of marching and drumming in the past year since the passing of um, Monica, uh, but we're regrouping and Although we haven't done many actions, we've done a, uh, lots of memorials um, around her passing and just processing um, the whole loss with one another. So we gather together and we drum and you know we share stories and we eat and yeah. And how long have you been doing that? Um, I've been with Boom Shake Music uh, for about five years. Mm -hmm. Um, on and off, uh, uh, marching with them and stuff, but uh, most recently involved in creating imagery for them and for uh, the, the their events. And so, is the the marching and the drumming the main subject matter for your paintings now? I like to work in a lot of different. Uh, I have a lot of different inter interests. So um, I am working on a series of boom shake music and the uh, the different um, the people that come through there. You know, uh, I also am working on a series about um, the the how the homeless community. Um, I grew up in public housing, so I'm doing a series that that talks about public housing and, and uh, you know, is that a solution for the homeless uh, uh, problem that we have today? Um, so I, I want to try to create dialogue around a lot of things that, um, you know, that, that are weighing on me. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. Well so, uh, Julia, thank you so much for sharing us uh, more insight into your work, and we're so glad that you could join us tonight. Thank you. Okay, so the next artist we're going to hear from is Maya Planidas. So, mm -hmm. Maya, if you go ahead and unmute uh, yourself, uh, introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining us from, uh, talk about your piece that's in the exhibition, and specifically your inspiration to submit to the Voyage National Jury Exhibition. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so my name is Maya and I work in self-portraits. Uh, this piece is part of Dream Series. Um, it's called Grounded. Um, inspiration came from Pacifica, a beach just outside of San Francisco. Um, I took a drawn shot of this rock. Uh, this rock is one that stays while um, the waves are constantly crashing it. And if you've ever been in ocean, um, you know how powerful it can get. Um, so I was admiring this rock and that inspired me to create this piece, um, which for me, it's um, whatever it happens, you always have something to kind of hold on to. Yeah. So thank you for inviting me to this show. Okay, so this is an inkjet print. So is this uh, all digital or is, is this hand embellished or can you describe the process a little bit more specifically? Yeah, so um, I took a, a shot with a drawn and then I took a photo of myself digitally and then I blended together in the Photoshop. So it's very controlled, but also loose. Okay, so... Um... All your work is a uh, is 
digital prints of uh, photography? Most of them. Um, I also do double exposures, but lately, um, because I do cell portraits and I put a tripod and then I go back and forward 10 seconds until I get a shot I want. Um, so sometimes it's just um, it's just easier to do it digitally rather than um, you know wasting the whole film. Um, so I do either shots like this that I create kind of idea and then I make it in Photoshop or a shot that are totally just one click and then it's done. Um, but it's all kind of very similar um, self-portrait uh, without showing face um, surreal. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we noticed that you're facing away from us. So all your pieces have, are you facing away from the viewer? Yeah, I I don't have a I don't I don't think it's necessary to show face because what I want to share with people it's the same feeling that all humans have it's not about um, you know face um, I think we are very similar each of us so okay and so I thought that the uh, having the super imposition of the rock uh, from the back of your head so it kind of looks like the the hair, the hair um, on the back of your head blends right into the rock. And that's really brilliant. So once you saw the image of the rock, did you immediately know that you wanted to uh, do that with your head superimposed? No, um, it's very intuitive. I take photos of myself in a different position. And I have a vague idea, but often when I try to put it together, it just doesn't work. Um, and then I, um, and then, then just try playing with the pieces until something comes up. So this was, I wanted to do photo with ocean and with the rock, but I didn't imagine it like this. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, more information about the process. And we're so glad that you uh, submitted to the juried exhibition and that you could join us tonight. Thank you. Okay. And so uh, the next artist we're going to hear from is Jody Schultz. So Jody, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself, introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from. Talk about your piece that's in the exhibition and your inspiration for the theme. Oh, great. So um, hi, my name is Jody Schultz. Um, I currently live in West Wendover, West Wendover Nevada. Hard to say. Um, I'm going to talk about my process and inspiration first. Um, because I think it'll give you more insight into my piece when I begin, begin to talk about the piece. Um, so I'm primarily a mixed media artist, um, currently really focused on uh, painting using a combination of collage and, and uh, acrylics on wood. Um, I also create assemblage um, work and I like using natural and man-made artifacts in addition to the acrylics and collage. So my painting process really involves building up and tearing down layers of paint and collaged materials to create a sense of sort of history and archaism. Um, the process is really meant to represent the cycles of life and death. Um, I prefer to work on wood uh, panels and other hard substrates because they uh, can really take the abuse of sanding and scratching and heavy layering. Um, I'm really interested in the concept of transmigration and possibility and that the energy we possess is on its own journey through space and time with its own history and, and memory of sorts. Um, so through my work, I am really seeking um, to explore my own experiences and my own memories. Um, so in the beginning of any piece, um, I like to uh, let play sort of take over. Um, I try to really respond intuitively to things that resonate with me. Um, and then I incorporate them into the work. Um, I then deliberately reveal some things and obscure others as I go through the process of refining the work. Um, I often create a shape or shapes in my final passes that reveal things that are important to my story. Um, these shapes sort of act like windows uh, to other elements that resonate um, with my soul. Um, so this is uh, my piece, Time Travelers. Um, uh, the focus of Time Travelers is on transportation, um, because for me, the thrill of any journey um, is the ride to get there. I absolutely love the rush that comes from riding on anything with power and speed. Um, the, the exhilaration of moving fast through time and space is something that really lights me up. Uh, for me, the journey is much more important than the destination. Um, 
On a deeper level, this work holds clues to my history, um, my place, and my life journey. Um, horses, of course, are emphasized in this work primarily because they are my greatest passion and definitely part of my soul's journey. Um, horses have also been incredibly essential to human voyage throughout time. Um, they've inspired humans to travel across even greater expanses, um, eventually, of course, using progressively faster, more efficient vehicles. Um, but to this day, we refer to power, um, the power of a combustible engine as horsepower. Um, and so I chose to celebrate the contribution and importance of these amazing creatures in my artwork. So um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, Jody, thank you so much for giving us insight to your process and your motivation for making this piece. Um, I just wanted to address, you know, again, your colors are very interesting here, especially the colors of the contrast of the horse versus the background. Um, so could you just address that for us? Um, the, or, the, the color is really meant to, to sort of represent the energy um, and the spirit of the animals. Um, it's in some respects, the environment. I live in the Nevada desert, so we have a lot of of tans and and uh, ochres and and sort of sage greens, um, but but the red is really that power and that fury and that strength because um, wild horses are everywhere out here. So that sort of you know symbolizes their energy. Yeah, I have a love hate relationship with trains. Um, I they are so amazing. Uh, they we have them all over here, and they um, they're so powerful. I I love getting on my bike and riding next to the trains. But on the flip side, they kill a lot of wild horses. The horses will uh, oftentimes try to beat the trains. And so the, the train going through the horses is sort of their relationship, good and bad. Um, but I do. I love trains, but I also hate them because they kill the animals I love. So um, so this is a, a 16 by 16 inch. So this is a yes. uh, standard size that you work in. I, I'm all over the place. I, I'm starting to try to go a lot bigger, um, but I I. I am very intimate with my work. I actually kind of like working on smaller boards, but I, I have been pushing myself to go bigger. Okay, so, well, uh, thank you so much yeah. for joining us tonight and giving us more uh, understanding of your piece. It was uh, great to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you, Jody. Okay, so the next artist that um, was signed up to talk tonight is Veronica Wong, and unfortunately she wasn't able to, to join us, but this is the piece that's in the exhibition. Okay, so thank you to all the artists that participated in the artist talk tonight and shared so much information about their piece, their process, and their inspiration. And also, uh, thank you for everyone in the viewing audience for uh, joining us tonight to watch and listen to the artists talk about their work. So thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you at future programs or in the gallery sometime. Take care. <music>